had a Indian mate who I called Koran, but maybe yeah. he just stopped correcting people. Yeah, that's what I've done as well. Yeah. I, uh, you know, everyone, I've been called everything from Karen, uh, Quran, you know, the holy book, uh, Karan. Uh, I've had like an Irish one call me Curran. Uh, I've had pretty much everything. So yeah, after a point, you just stop correcting someone. Curran. Curran, yeah. I say like current affairs, no tea. Okay, I like that. Dr. Curran. Yeah, you just call me Curran. Can you give us like an intro from <clears throat> social media? Because some people will be like, oh, I recognize the name. An intro as in... Seven things that you never knew. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was the most recent one you've done? Um, I duetted a video of uh, someone uh, cleaning someone's leg before surgery. The bunion. Yeah, the bunion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see everything. <laughs> Don't worry, I see everything. So uh, interestingly enough, came across your content, must have been maybe six to 12 months ago. And out of curiosity, I, I followed you, I liked your stuff, found it fascinating. I was like, I wonder if his TikTok following translates to Instagram. And as I went over, it said, follow back. And I was like, wow, like you <laughs> followed me from before and you just said in Waitrose since 2018. Yeah. So, I mean, I've been on social media in some format since 2012. I started uh, a YouTube channel in 2012, but that was very different to the style of content I do now. Uh, I made clinical education videos for med students, um, student nurses, doctors, whatever. So how to examine an abdomen, how to examine the cardiovascular system. And some of those, weirdly enough, fell into like an ASMR space on YouTube because people love like the doctor ASMR thing. I don't know, that's a rabbit hole you need to explore. Um, but yeah, I was on there. That got a bit of a cult following. And then I didn't do anything on social media from 2012 to probably about 2018 because just doctor life took over and was so stressful and social media was the last thing on my head. And then, yeah, I started posting some stuff on Instagram, just like history posts, medical history, uh, things like that. And then obviously saw your content, followed you, Diren, uh, and the whole crew, uh, Paula Lima, all these guys. And I was like, yeah, it's really funny, engaging. And actually, this was, a lot of the stuff you said rang so true. Like when I was in medical school, you don't get a lot of uh, advice and teaching on nutrition and things like that. And, you know, when I was in medical school, uh, I live very close to the gym. I went to the gym in medical school every day. And, you know, I always had this thing in my mind where I want to get a six pack. Okay. And the kind of concepts I had in my mind were so wrong. And they, you know, were percolating throughout the fit fitness industry. You know, they're kind of, oh, no, you need to eat um, no carbs to get a six pack and things like that. And then actually watching your stuff, it was entertaining and informative. I was like, you know what, this is legit. And then that's when I started actually feeling better and eating better and training better. Uh, so yeah, that's why, that's why I followed you. Thank you very much. Very kind. And also you present yourself very well on the podcast for your first podcast. Thank you very much. Some people can sometimes get in front of a microphone and be like, so, and they, they're not quite sure what to do. That was nice. It was like a media trained perfect depiction of an introduction <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest with you okay uh i get a lot of comments saying i literally some guy tagged me in some other guy's video who's like a some pharmacist or something on tiktok and that video that pharmacist got i think it got like a couple of million views and it was a good video and then someone he commented oh if you keep going like this you can be like that dr curran page one day and then the guy, and then the other guy said, "Oh no, he's got like a whole team behind him, and uh, you know, so yeah, if I get a team, maybe I can do that." And I was just thinking, that's kind of like a backhanded compliment because, okay, you're saying that my content seems like I've got a team and a production crew behind it, but actually, I'm a one man band, and um, yeah, I, honestly, I don't know what I'm doing on social media. I just put stuff out there. Some stuff will flop. Some stuff will do well. But I just do it because I want to do it. It's a, this is a this great one. This is why I'm excited to have this conversation about you're approaching 5 million followers on TikTok, which is incredible. And the, some of your content bangs, like flies through the universe of social media. <laughs> and the way you portray it is, is rather unique. And for anyone that hasn't seen it, you use almost like an elevator pitch to bring someone into a scientific medical condition or whatever it is and explain it and bring clarity to there's a lot of parallels between our work and you're so consistent with putting content out you're everywhere you're mm. what most social creators should all aspire to be and you're also juggling that with a full-time medical 
profession. Tell us a little bit about your actual your actual job because I bet some people go, oh, it's right for you. Your job's TikTok. And you're like, well, fuck it out, mate. Can't yeah. <laughs> you know what? Like um, a lot of, I wouldn't say a lot of people, but occasionally I come across a comment saying, uh, what do you actually do? Are you even a real doctor? Because, you know, this guy, me, I'm uploading between one and three TikTok posts a day. But you've got to realize that a TikTok post that I make could be 15 seconds to 20 seconds to 30 seconds. I've got a few minutes in my day to make a couple of TikToks. But my actual job, my full-time job, not my side hustle, is I'm a general surgeon in the NHS. So general surgery encompasses everything from breast cancers to bowel cancers to gallbladder operations, hernias, emergency stuff like removing dead bowel, uh, appendicitis, um, skin cancers. You know, it's pretty varied, which is why I've gone into it. Keeps it exciting. Um, but it is stressful. It is busy. I do night shifts. I do late shifts. Uh, I have to get up sort of 5.45 to drive in an hour to work. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty miserable some days. Uh, I'm not going to lie and say, um, you know, it's my destiny. It's like I've wanted to do this all my life. I didn't want to do it all my life. Uh, I just realized that I quite liked science when I was at school and fell into it. And I like the fast pace of surgery. But yeah, it's it's a struggle to maintain a full-time surgical job and what is now becoming a full-time social media job. Like, you know, it, I always thought, oh, social media, people who create content have it so easy. But actually, this rapid growth over the last two years on various platforms and the expectation of people that you need to keep coming up with content you're burdened with that expectation. And the burden of that expectation is you need to make content and the quality of your content has to keep going up. You know, if you look at what I was doing in late 2019, early 2020, when I started on TikTok, you know, it was very basic, very raw, and it's still similar to all the stuff I do now. I just get up a phone and, you know, green screen some stuff behind me. But the production quality has gone up, you know, significantly. And that comes with more effort, more input from your side. And yeah, you need to organize your life to make all these things happen. And it's becoming increasingly difficult for me. Uh, family life? Single, uh, only child. I don't know if that comes across in any of posts or anything I do uh, or how I carry myself. Got a dog, I'm married to the dog, married to surgery um, and married to social media. Do you ever find as well that maybe impeding, like you're like, wow, this job and this profession uh, or let's say, let's say hobby for the time being, hobby and profession, two monumental tasks. Is there part of you in the back of your mind that's going, I'm going to have to bring a family into this soon? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I would like to get married soonish. I need to find the right person. I want to kind of be a young dad. That's always been an aspiration for me. But yeah, I, I've always, it's been weird. I don't know how I would juggle family and social media, not in the sense of, you know, how am I going to pay attention to my family? Because there's only, you know, my family will always come first. But it's in the sense of how do I shield my family from the stresses and the lows and the kind of all sorts of odd things which happen and the baggage that comes with social media? Would I want my kids to be on my stories? Would I want their faces out there? Could they be victimized in some way or you know, attacked, not not getting ahead of myself and saying I'm this famous person, but, you know, the odd person does recognize you. And if they don't like you by, you know, association, they won't like your family. And would that have any negative impact? Do you know what? This is something that I was very excited to talk to you about where TikTok in itself is, there's, there's almost a bit of fear when you post a good post because you don't know where it's going. And there is extreme yeah. volatility with it. Uh, I just hit the 1 million mark on TikTok last night. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but there's also the fear that comes with it. Um, yeah. I sit there and I go, this is, I can't undo this. Like, you cannot undo the millions of people that have seen you <laughs> talk. And and with that, you know, when you said you like went into the comments, I have to G myself up and be ready. I have to put on a shield of armor before I go into the tags, the mention, the comments. It's almost like a mixture of YouTube and Twitter comments combined. Yes. And TikTok people are very unforgiving because they're young. Yeah. The tweets, not as young as everyone would think, but remember the tweets you might have sent 10 years ago without really even giving any shadow of a thought and you're mm. like, wow, I was, I was a fucking 16 year old idiot. They're now on your videos. <laughs> you find this? I, so it's really uh, weird. I think um, the more you grow on TikTok in terms of following, uh, your engagement uh, the ratio of your engagement to your followers naturally, you know, dies down in the way that an example would be, you know, if you've got a hundred thousand followers 
and you have a video that gets 50,000 views, you might get 20,000 likes on that video. If you've got 10 million followers and you get a video that gets 2 million views, you might get, you know, not in all cases, but you might only get 100,000 to 200,000 video likes on that uh, video. Um, and that's just the natural way of how social media works. And I think when you're smaller, you have a more of a kind of tight knit community where there's less toxic, you know, dumpster fire comments. But as you, you know, get bigger, you obviously attract your own following who like your content and no matter what, they will always support you in most cases. But you'll also attract other people who happen by your content and think, actually, do you know what? I'm going to comment something just for the sake of trolling, uh, you know, striking a nerve, whatever it is. Uh, and yeah, you'll get that with everything. But the natural psychology of what we like to do, and it's almost like a evolutionary survival thing. When you're reading a list of 100 comments, you will naturally be drawn to the negative comments as a protective mechanism. You want to see that and you think, oh, God. That, that's and this your, is my reality. Yeah, and your whole reality and psychology will be skewed by that one comment, but you'll ignore the 99 other positive comments, which is like, oh my God, amazing, you've changed my life. Or, F- fuck off, not reading, not reading, not reading. No, you go. And it's the, there's the story of, if I say don't think of a purple elephant, it's all you can think about. Yes. So the more you try and suppress this emotion, the more abundant it is. And then you know it's not true or you don't believe it to be true, but then you manifest it in your own mind and then suddenly you're driving down the road thinking, fuck, why am I why am I so drawn up and caught upon this one thing that someone said? Yeah, like this same thing, this kind of reverse psychology is I've um I've read about it a lot when it comes to insomnia. Uh and uh, just as an aside, which I've used myself. When I first started as a doctor, I suffered with insomnia and I was doing a lot of reading about it, uh cognitive behavioral therapy and all sorts of things. And this one thing I thought, no, that can't work, and it did. And it's basically you tell yourself, I'm not going to sleep. And you stay awake. Like you don't read a book or you don't on your phone, not TV, nothing. You just lie in bed, eyes open, and you're forcing yourself to stay awake. And, you know, almost like you're saying, think of a pink elephant and you think of, don't don't think of a pink elephant and you think of a pink elephant. Tell yourself, don't go to sleep. Don't go to sleep. In many cases, you will feel tired and you will fall asleep. And that worked for me. Uh, That was an anecdotal thing, but... If, you know, I've done a lot of reading around this area and, you know, you can't, that's a kind of this reverse psychology does work in other areas of your life as well. Tried to, I'm thinking straight away when you said that, I was like, when a guy goes out thinking, I can't cheat on my missus tonight, they manifest the hottest girls from the club. <laughs> but then the time that you get, have you seen the film Hall Pass? Yes. So yeah. the second they're like, right, you can go out, you can do anything. Suddenly your actions there, you're repelling every single girl that's there. Yeah. Could go the same way, you know, and that's a really fucked up thing. Yeah. That's very, it's very strange. Uh, I also want to say I very much commend your line of work. You know, yeah. there's uh, a not, when, when during lockdown, pandemic, everything, when everyone went outside and clapped for the NHS, I, I, I felt inside, I, I never said openly about it. I was like, what the fuck is this? I was like, you were fighting these people for loo roll two weeks before. <laughs> and now you're clapping for them. I was like, do something better, you know? And there's so many things that I, I'll be perfectly honest. I don't know enough about, the NHS, the workers in it. I don't know about hour shifts, pay, all of these things. I'm completely yeah. naive to it. But from what I understand, people are doing too much too often. And that there's, you know, people say, James, you got any tips? People do night shift. I'm like, yeah, do a different job. But it doesn't take into account the service industry. And that goes from surgeons, doctors, all the way to ambulance drivers. And, you know, every single person within that system. And unfortunately, bad things happen to people outside of our circadian rhythm. Yeah, I think, you know, that whole clap for carers thing, uh, I don't want to get too political and uh, get cancelled. Uh, By all means, you don't know. feel the need to do that. Just <laughs> but, but, but um, you know, I, rather than the clap, uh, I would like to just get a pay rise, uh, not have it to pay for my parking at work, uh, maybe have subsidized food in the canteen. Um, you know, I think still there's this myth that doctors, surgeons are super rich. That's not the case. Uh, a first year junior doctor, so you've done five, six years of medical school and maybe you've done a postgraduate degree as well and you start as a doctor at the age of 24 and you think most people who have finished three-year degrees have been earning since the age of 21, gone to the city or whatever. You start as a doctor, 23, 24, 25, something like that and your first year's wages 
uh, is somewhere around the realms of £30,000. Now, that is a lot of money for a lot of people, don't get me wrong. But, um, you know, I, I personally think, compared, if you look at other countries, um, that's significantly devaluing, um, you know, a hardcore healthcare professional who's doing night shifts, uh, who's kind of like leaving their families, and young kids, uh, you know, uh, overnight and is sitting in the hospital and doing, you know, horrific stuff and seeing horrific stuff. Uh, I think um, probably could go up in terms of reward. 100%. And I mean, you think about that is what you probably give an entry level recruiter in the city yeah. to work nine to five. Don't check your emails when you get home. You will be, you'll, you know, we're going to need you to make a hundred calls a day. I'm sure a lot of medical professionals would love to have a couple of weeks out of their life where they could clock in nine till five and get a regular sleep pattern. You know, you know that is a thing. Like, uh, I think someone, there's all these kind of, on Twitter, you read these things about someone's actually gone into the comparison of how much um, a manager at uh, McDonald's would earn per hour because their hours are fixed versus a doctor whose hours are not necessarily fixed. And, they, you know, if a patient's dying and it's 5 p.m., you can't be like, see you later you've got to stay for the hour, sort them out, make sure they're safe. And that could be an extra two hours. And then you hand over and leave. So actually the kind of lost hours, if you account for them, we're earning less than, you know, some certain like catering jobs, you know, if you work in McDonald's and things like that. Um, but also, yeah, I, I mean, um, if you, um, I know you love kind of reading about sleep and um, what's his name? Uh, Dr. Matt Walker. Uh, I think it was in that book he said that, um, you know, healthcare jobs and night shifts should come with a cancer warning. You know, increases your risk of cancer and all sorts of neurodegenerative diseases, cardiovascular diseases. So, yeah, I mean, I'm in a job that is literally killing me. If you were to work out on an oil rig or something of high dangerous caliber, you'd be paid very well for it. Yeah. There's something you mentioned there as well. Something I read about, uh, for my latest book called The Zygonic Effect. Oh, yeah. Which is uh, waiters remember bills that are left open, but the second they close the bill, they f they forget it. So when a task is left unfinished, it creates like a mental load and stress. And people now when studying are trying to study a bit, go do something else, come back and then study the rest. They leave that loop opened. Mm. I can imagine for yourself that if you've, you know, operated on someone, you've opened a loop. And now you are supposed to go home and sleep and not think about the outcome of that. And, oh, just go home. It'll be fine. We, yeah. We're not going to see you for seven hours. But all these open loops, the person you removed, you know, colon, the other person you did this, suddenly, you know, you go into work the next day. Oh, how did that guy do? Is he all right? Do you get that kind of feedback from... Yeah, I mean, all the time. So literally yesterday, I had an all-day operating list where I was operating with one of my bosses and we removed a bowel cancer on the left side of their colon. And I stitched the colon back onto the colon like two pipes stitched them back together and all went really well patient was fine at the end of the operation i saw them afterwards they were fine but there's something when you do bowel cancer operations and you remove the cancer and the intestine and then you join the two remaining cut ends of the intestine back together there's one risk we always warn patients about and that risk could be anywhere from four percent to ten percent there's a risk of something called an anastomotic leak. Well, the intestines can just come apart. The stitches come apart and they leak. And they leak shit into the abdomen. And obviously you can die if your shit's leaking into your abdomen. You don't need to be medical to know that. Um, so that is a risk that could happen for anywhere from day one after the operation to day five, six, seven. So until this patient goes home, I'm going to be thinking in the back of my mind, I put those stitches in his colon. So actually... You know, this morning before I came here, I texted someone who's working right now and is re reviewing that patient on a ward round, just saying, how is he? You know, and I, I shouldn't be doing that. I'm constantly checking, you know, how is he? Is he okay? Is he going to go home tomorrow? You know, kind of things like that. And yeah, so I'm carrying that burden with me every day on any patients I operate on, even if it's something simple, like I remove someone's appendix. I'm not mentally fully clear and happy until they've gone home. I'm still not not even anywhere close to this level, but everyone keeps saying to me, oh, you must be buzzing about this, buzzing about that. I, I can't enjoy a book writing process that's finished and I can't enjoy the touring until I've done the events. For me, those loops can't close. You know, for so many people, they're like, oh, you know, you finished the book, that must be great. I'm like, no, I've got to wait till pub day and all mm. of this. So I experience these loops in my own life, but they're not life-threatening. They're just performance-based. So back to your point, yeah. I, and you know what as well? This is probably a controversial thing. People say about donating to charity, donating to charity. I think that ambiguity or ambiguous nature of not knowing where the money's going, 
imagine if someone created like a fund where they go, okay, this is going to go to NHS surgeons that are underslept and overtired. It's going to pay for their parking and it's going to put a nutritionist chef in the kitchen to cook them better meals. Yeah. I'd be like, yeah, fucking, do you know what? Have some money. Let's, let's raise money for that. I think that in the sales process, you have to be so direct. I help women between 30 and 45. <laughs> Again, you know, I think charity should almost take that angle a bit. As fuck, you have to pay for parking. Yeah, it's pretty fucked. Uh, it's, you know, and in the current job I'm working right now, I'm paying about, uh, when I don't bring my own meals from home, I'm paying about five or six pounds for a lunch. And it is literally slop. It's slop and gloop. Like, you know, chili con carne, which doesn't look like chili con carne. Uh, and this is the, you know, when people talk about ultra processed foods and what they mean by that is food that no longer looks like the source it came from. So if you take some chicken and you ultra process it, like a pate, it no longer looks like the original food. That is what I get in the hospital. They say, here's some lamb stew or whatever. It doesn't look like that. It looks like pellets. And, you know, that kind of stuff is not adequate enough to, you know, fuel and feed someone who's working a 12-hour shift and a very stressful 12-hour shift. Um, so, yeah, it, it's there's a... Listen, the NHS is fantastic for many reasons. But there's also lots of flaws inherent within any, you know, stretched, overstretched system. And, you know, I, I've, I've had a long chat with my parents because, you know, being, um, you know, Asian, uh, they're obviously, it's like a, it's in, inbred within Asian culture. Like, you know, you, it's like an on running joke, right? Oh, you, your son's a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer. And, you know, that's kind of like a, a almost like, um, you know, a cultural thing. It's like a badge of honor. They were really happy when I became a doctor, when I got into medical school, when I, became a surgeon, all these kind of things. And, you know, when I told them, I don't think I'll be a surgeon for the rest of my life, uh, they were honestly shocked. They were like, what are you going to do? What do you, you know? And being on social media and over the last two years of the pandemic opened my eyes. Like life is very short. Like, I, you know, I saw a lot of people die within the space of, you know, half an hour, uh, all sorts of things. So it was a very stressful time at the hospital, but also just generally in the world. And that opened my eyes to think, you know what? I actually don't want to do this for the rest of my life, my peak years, my 30s, 40s, and, you know, gone completely here. Although I love surgery and I love medicine, I do want to love life a bit more. Like in the last two years alone, no, three years alone, I've probably missed about uh, five or six very close friends' wedding. Fuck. Because I couldn't swap my on call or I couldn't swap a night shift or something. So I don't want that to happen for the rest of my life. What if that then becomes I'm missing my son's wedding in, you know, whatever, 30 years time? Uh, that'd be horrible. These are all things that I, for myself, don't cross my mind on like a daily basis. Like I'm incredibly lucky to have almost created a life that bypasses these things. And I really hope that you'll be able to do the same. And I think it's noble as well that although you're doing your time you know, in the trenches, you're also at the same time putting money into the ISA of social media. And a lot of people I bet within your family and maybe even your friends don't quite understand what you're doing. They don't quite, yeah. they don't quite get it. And uh, John, I had this with my friends the other week. I came in and I, I was like, guys, I've, I've, I've had a video that got a million hits in an hour and a half. And they were like, oh, fucking shut up about TikTok. And I love that because they're my mates. But I was like, you guys don't understand there's something happening here that yeah. could potentially... And you know, I've joked with them on the podcast last week. I go, we got an 85 inch fucking TV because of this. You know, you got a sort of soundbar. I went, you got a business class fucking flight home to your parents and back because of this. Yeah. Don't, you know, and it's a crazy time we live in with socials and the fact that, you know, I bet some days you're fucked and you're like, I've got to put a video out today. I've got, because <laughs> I'm the same. Absolutely. And otherwise you feel like more of a piece of shit because yeah. it's, it's not just narcissism. It might be a little element of it, especially for myself. It's opportunity. Mm. And that opportunity is something where you don't want to sleep on it. And I hope to fucking God that in five, 10 years time, maybe even less, that you have an avenue to just leave and you say, look, I, I did my time. Like my, my, not even in the same fucking world. I did like five solid years of personal training and I was fucked yeah. the whole time. I didn't save anyone's life. I, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, you never know. I didn't Give them good habits and things like that. But I wasn't removing colons or stitching up shit. <laughs> and like, you know, it's like an incredibly watered down version. But then later on in life, when I live a life that's a lot, lot less stressful, I look back at those years. I love them. I cherish them. And the days that I was getting up at 4.45 to go to work. But like, even then I had a regular shift pattern. I was in a gym. I was around healthy people all the time. I was around people in good moods. I was around people that had the financial ability to come pay for PT. I find 
hospital environments as they rightly probably should be quite somber, quite, you know, it must be a yeah. tough thing from a mental perspective to keep turning up and shit food, pay for parking. Like all of those, There's only so much human can take before. It's, um, you know, I think there's a lot of good things to be said about monotony in someone's life. Um, monotony sometimes get a bad rep, but actually it breeds um, routine, good habits. You know, monotony in some senses is good. You know, every day I'm going to go to the gym for an hour. I'm going to go for a half an hour walk. I'm going to walk my dog. I'm going to eat this vegetable. You, you know, it's that is good in some senses, but also monotony can be disruptive to creativity, disruptive to uh, a positive mood and all these things. So every day for an hour, I'm stuck in a steel box in my car, driving an hour to work. And then in the evening, I'm driving an hour back. So that's two hours out of 24 hours, one in 12, about 8% of my day that's stuck in a car. Um, and then, you know, uh, I often I'm holding in my pee for a five hour surgery, rookie mistake. I still make those rookie mistakes. Um, I'm hungry cause I haven't, um, eaten anything all day or I'm starving, uh, or, you know, I'm thirsty. There's no, the kitchen's closed. Uh, and all of these things are kind of micro doses of stress, which just accumulate over time. And it, you know, gives you a big stress. So, you know, there's lots of micro stresses that other people undergo on a daily basis, like, you know, checking your phone first thing in the morning, checking your phone before you go to bed, or, you know, some email that you might read that just stresses you out. And these same micro stresses in my life and other people's life, they accumulate. It's the cumulative load of all of these stresses that kind of impact us. And um, yeah, and I, I would honestly be lying if I said, over the last two years, uh, I hadn't had thoughts of leaving the NHS entirely because I honestly felt burnt out. Um, you spoke a bit about maybe potentially going overseas. You spoke about Australia mm. a little bit. Yeah. Their GPs get paid <laughs> extortionate amounts. Yeah, I know. I've got some friends out there. I think I saw, um, I could be wrong. It was either $400,000, $200,000. Or if I, I always sometimes exaggerate things in my mind, it is my memory. Or either way, it was two hundred thousand dollars, hundred thousand pounds. So it was one of the two to work as a GP on the northern beaches, which is one of the most lovely parts of Australia. And like you say, other countries are, are appreciating those staff members, people like that. I think as a society, we forget, you know, the the, the underpinning nature of what so much is going on. Yeah, a very controversial thing here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask: surgery is that a male-dominated industry? As I would be led to believe. Um, historically and traditionally, yes, it's a boys club and historically it's traditionally a white boys club, particularly in the UK, obviously, um, that is changing. There's a lot more diversity. Um, you know, a previous hospital I've worked in where I would say the majority of the surgeons there, um, have been, you know, ethnic minorities, you know, Indian, Pakistani, Nigerian, uh, but then a lot of them were still predominantly male. But I see that uh, as changing significantly. Now, there's a, still a long road to go for you know, true change to be observed. But I see a lot more, um, you know, female trainees coming through, uh, female surgical trainees. And in some cases, in the cohorts, more women than men coming into surgery. Uh, and I think that's great. Because actually one of the best trainers I've had, one of my best bosses, um, you know, she was a fantastic surgeon. Um, and a lot of people and patients as well have this inbuilt dogma to think, actually, no, I want a male surgeon for some reason. They think, I don't know, it's 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 not... I think it's show- movies. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Like you see any, every time in like a film where they're like scrubbing up or whatever it is. Yeah. This is why I ask, because my, uh, I suppose my perception of that industry is very much being male orientated and I'm not sure I say it's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's, you know, even doctors and nurses where we've kind of got gender profiling going on a bit, you know, again, it's safe to say that on average, women are more interested in people and men are more interested in things. Uh, and, and it's great to see crossover. And I've spoken about this in the most recent book and people straight away, I get so ready to be angry at you for saying that I go, men are taller than women. But that doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of women that are taller than men. Yeah. And it, I think it's great that that is something that's, that's definitely happening. But like for so many of us, we kind of overlook the fact there are so many people that are just grafting through life so that we can live the fairy tale. Yeah. I mean, 
you know, nothing I do or say or, you know, achieve to this day would be, you know, possible without my parents. Uh, I'm, uh, I get, I get confused with these kind of first generation, second generation things, but, um, you know, I was born in India. Uh, I came to the UK when I was five via Nairobi and Hong Kong. Uh, so a bit of a jet set kid. Um, my parents were born in India as well. So I, I came to the UK five-year-old. Um, I don't know if I had an Indian accent or not because I went to international school before, so I don't know. Uh, but all I know is that I feel, um, you know, kind of a British for whatever. I feel like I've been born here, but my parents definitely grinded throughout. Like, you know, I would say I'm privileged. They gave me everything I wanted in life, took me on holidays, gave me, bought me whatever toys I wanted. I was a spoiled brat when I was a kid, for sure. Only child, only child of Indian parents. You know, they would kind of shower their son with love. But every point, like taking me to swimming lessons, taking me to violin lessons, uh, you know, taking me to this like specific event for after school and, you know, all those little things, which not just paying for things, but actually time invested, which is priceless. Uh, I wouldn't be where I am. Or even like today, um, I dropped my dog off at my parents' house um, who are just, and they're just looking after my dog all day. Like, you know, otherwise I'd have to go, who's going to be, who's free on a bank holiday to look after my dog? You know, doggy daycare is closed for the bank holiday. Um, so it's all these little things which, are, you know, sometimes I take for granted. Um, yeah, which is massively important to, you know, com- you know, being what I am today. So one thing, has no food prep company ever approached you? Yeah, they have. Uh, should I say? Uh, I shouldn't say them. That's not like plugging them, isn't it? But yeah, there was um, some food prep company got in touch with me and said, uh, can we send you some of these meals and whatnot? I think they they assumed I was like a a, a, a novice on social media. And I, I am a novice. I, you know, I'm still figuring out the landscape. But they kind of said, uh, can you post uh, like a reel and a few stories and we'll give you like a, you know, a few things. And I was like, what? And I was thinking to myself, like, listen, I don't actually, I don't want your money. I don't want money for this and, you know, whatever. If you're a small company coming up, I'll just do it, like a post, whatever. But, you know, don't try and take a mile when I'm just giving you an inch. This is why I fucking, I hate this shit, right? Because sometimes people will be like, oh, James, can we send you this? We um, Just give us a story. And I'm like, nah, fuck off. But if someone just sends me something, out of yeah. the goodness of their heart, I understand the game, obviously. Yeah. There's a commercial angle with it. But like, if I get sent a free T-shirt, someone goes, I love your stuff, have some T-shirts. I'll wear that T-shirt all the fucking time. Yeah. And I've got no, someone goes, where'd you get your T-shirt? I said, oh, this is this company in Queensland that send me my shorts. Send me crazy pairs of shorts. People go, where'd you get them from? I'll take them in the story. I don't do any paid stuff. So many people like, just fucking don't make it such a commercial thing because if people like your business, you won't have to ask for it. Yeah, absolutely. And any food prep companies that are out here, just feed the man. <laughs> feed the man. Don't let him eat this commercial shit. If no one comes through, I'll, I know a couple of companies in the UK. I'll be like, how much do you want for a year? Feed this man for a year. Let's see, let's see, if, let's see how many followers he's got that come to the end of it. Have you got like uh, commercial ideas or are you kind of just building up a following? You know what? It's, uh, this is probably one of the trickiest things to navigate on social media for me because uh, I'm relatively new to the social media space. I've been doing this since really doing this. Do you mind if I ask how old you are? I'm 32. Okay. Last uh, last week, maybe? Same birthday as you. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. 23rd of May. Yeah. 1990, though. 1990. You're yeah. 89. Yeah. Born in the 80s. What can I say? 80s, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, I've been really doing this since 2020 when I've like kind of blew up, um, you know, quote unquote. 10 year overnight success. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, I feel guilty. When I, I've done maybe two uh, kind of sponsored posts, right? One was for uh, like Pink Lady Apples, um, where, you know, I spoke about mental health and the kind of eating fiber and healthy kind of, you know, five and fruit a day and all that kind of stuff. I thought that was okay. I was in line with kind of my audience and what I do and promote mental health and all that kind of stuff. And the other one I did for a uh, arthritis charity to talk about uh, invisible conditions, uh, where, you know, arthritis, anyone can have it, you know, not necessarily elderly people, anyone can have it and it's invisible. Like, you know, you could have arthritis, but externally you look absolutely fine, but you could be struggling. Like, uh, Crohn's. Crohn's and things like that, you know, endometriosis, all these hidden, uh, invisible conditions, cancer even. Uh, and I did a p- sort of a post about that and I thought those were all uh, sort of okay. And then, but I always have this kind of fear, like say, 
um, you know, Nike approached me. Approach me. <laughs> uh, say Nike approached me. Dress the man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dress me. Give me good appreciate. Uh, Nike approached me and uh, they say, can you do a post on this or something like that? Um, any post I kind of do, even those things I mentioned I did, I felt guilty. Like I'm being paid to talk about something to an audience and it feels very staged. Disingenuous. Yeah. And, and that's why... I actually, I would say 99.9% recurring of the things that come to me, I give a really deep, hard thought and actually think, you know, I don't care about the money. I've got a full-time job. Is this something that my audience would appreciate? Is this something I'm in line with? I'm not just doing it. Like, for example, I won't name the names, but two huge probiotic companies approached me. A lot of people are obsessed with probiotics. Yeah? My dad loves probiotics, the, just the taste of it anyway. And they were said, you know, can you promote this probiotics and we'll, whatever, we'll make you an ambassador. And they were offering like, you know, a big chunk of change on a monthly basis almost, like a retainer fee. And, you know, it was double uh, my NHS salary per month. So you know, it's a significant thing to kind of say no to. But I have consistently made videos saying, you don't need probiotics. You don't Con need supplements. Conflict of interest. You know, yeah. I've literally gone out of my way to say, you just need to eat probiotics and prebiotics in the food. You don't need to buy supplements. And there's only a very sub specific subset of people who would benefit. You know, people have got inflammatory bowel diseases or uh, diarrhea after antibiotics. They may benefit from pro probiotics, may do. And that's the science. I'm following the science, not personal opinion. And actually I said, no to that company and I actually thought holy shit I just turned down you know you know this huge uh, you know chunk of change but you can sleep better I mean, I someone that's got yeah. a history of insomnia that's probably the yeah way. so I I, I I felt good about it though because like I can't on one hand say no and then be promoting this stuff to my audience so yeah I feel very um, awkward about doing this uh, but I have spoken to a lot of people and they say, you know, sometimes you, you know, if it's worthy, you just do it and you need to kind of get over that mental hump of doing things. But having said all of that, my long-term goal is kind of, you know, you know, growing up a YouTube following or, you know, similar to how you've done, you set up the kind of James Smith Academy app, something that is me and people want to follow me for me and they kind of get the reward and the knowledge and information without me selling them something that isn't me, you know? It's a, it's a really tough one. And, you know, I really hope that one day you get to a point where you could say to your audience, hey, I will give you better, more, you know, consistent content at a higher production. I will quit my job to serve you. As a byproduct, I need to do paid posts. And do you know what? For me, I'm, I'm the exact same. I get very uncomfortable with doing uh, anything. I've never done a paid promotion to this day, uh, but then I sell the books. So I'm yeah. like, you know, I, I will virtue signal a bit and be like, hey, I've never done that, but buy my book or come to a talk or whatever. But on the back of it, some of the offers I've had are, are fucking crazy. Yeah, I bet. Like even one of them was just to be in a TV advert for a furniture company that I use, that I bought. Perfect. And they were like, we're even going to make a pregnancy pillow. And like your range kind of thing, just come in the advert. And the advert alone would have been what my year's salary was. Yeah, wow. But then they said, can you not swear on the week that we dropped the advert on TV? And we're like, no, nah, we're not doing this. Like, really? It, yeah, it just felt like, it, that's how it starts. You know, people are yeah. like, oh no, I'll, I'll just do, I'll just try a little bit of Coke. You know, I just, <laughs> one line won't hurt. <laughs> you know? And I was like, no, because this is the free slope. And, oh. and it felt amazing to say no to that. And I was like, you know, one day something will come along in line with your values. And a lot of what is happening on social media, I honestly feel is like boxing. You mm. jab, you jab, you jab, you jab, you jab. Like a boxer never really knows when the hole is going to open up. So if someone's got their, their guard up, they've got their gloves high, the only thing you can do is keep jabbing and yeah. wait and wait. And people, you know, sometimes there might have been an opportunity. Guess what? You miss your opportunity to go for the chin, keep jabbing. And, you know, you just got to keep putting stuff out there until something comes along. You know, it's really funny you say that, but uh, I've seen multiple doctors on social media, and I'm not just talking about in the USA or something, in the UK itself, uh, who've got, you know, modest followings, promoting all sorts of crazy things. Uh, you know, like... Um, I know exactly uh, who you're talking about. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. We'll, we'll talk about it afterwards, off air. But, um, you know, promoting like vape pens for or smelling pens for weight loss and all these sort of things. Um, and I, I'm just thinking, 
um, you know, there's one thing promoting like, oh, you know, here are these crops that I'm wearing or these scrub uh, tops that I'm wearing. That's fine, uh, although it's a bit weird because um, why are you trying to sell, you know, scrub tops to an audience which is primarily probably non-medical? Um, but then, you know, doing things which are actually probably standing against what it means to be a doctor. So I would I would hate to do any of that. And, you know, I, I kind of, I see myself as I have this kind of core following who respect me for me, my opinion, my expertise and honesty and integrity. And that would actually be the biggest loss to just get 5,000 to do something and then you lose that trust of an audience because I've got a longer term vision. I don't know what it is, but I do have a longer term vision. We have a lot in common with this. I know exactly what you mean. And what happens is agencies become involved yeah. where the agencies go, yeah, I'll get them to do this. And they're getting 20%, maybe even 30%. So then the agency go back and go, nah, five grand's not enough. If you give him 10 grand, he'll do it. And then they go back and they go, oh, hey mate, you know that little scrubs uh, <laughs> advert? You know, they came in at five and they go, oh, you know, it's not really me. But now they're offering 10. <laughs> and they're like, 10's good, mate. You know, economic climate, tickets are down, festivals are down, <laughs> you know, cost of living. You know, they're in their ear like, how much did it cost you to fill up your car with petrol? Maybe that scrubs advert. Isn't it? You know, that's what's <laughs> yeah. going on. These conversations are happening. But, you know, it, like you say, the long game, because I guarantee, I'll be honest with you, sometimes your videos come up yeah. and, you know, if I'm not even on the mood, I'll tap it, double like. Really? Yeah. yeah. For the algorithm. Wow. And Thank you. And then, no, 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 you don't have to thank me for that. <laughs> like you say, you've probably got millions of people now to support the cause. Even if, you know, I'm, I'll be, I'll be like scrolling before bed. I'm not even watching things. And you'll come up with something. And sometimes if it's especially something squeamish, I'm like, I don't even want to know. But you're on, on fiber the other day, actually, when you were talking about how we can't digest fiber, but it feeds our microbiome. And, yeah. and, I, and do you know what? I knew that, but you reminded me and I go, fuck, I haven't eaten enough vegetables in the last few weeks. And I was like, like literally 10 seconds of your content benefited my, my habits. That's and like, amazing. And like, yeah. that's exactly why you should do what you do. I bet you, like me, you can't fathom that people are actually out there watching it, engaging with it. It, it feels like a slot machine to bots. Yeah. It, you know, when you, when you think about these numbers that we're working with on a grand scale, you know, like... Um, Unfathomable. Unfathomable. Unfathomable, yeah. Like, you know, 100,000 followers. People think, oh, because, you know, it's always like, what's next? You know, if someone's on 100,000, they're not satisfied. They want a million. A million wants 10. 10 wants 100. What's next? You, you know... Uh, you know, there, there's always this kind of divine discontent. You're always reaching for that next stage, but actually just be happy with what you've got. 100,000 is the biggest football stadium in the world. A million is 10 football stadiums full of people watching your content. So just be happy. You know, like I, and I'm not going to, you know, sit on my high horse here and say that, you know, I, I don't care about things. I was definitely, you know, when I was like grinding in the early stages of TikTok at 50,000, 100,000, even a million, I was like, oh, I want to be at this stage. I want to be at this stage. And actually, I finally say in the last six months, I finally sat back and thought, I actually don't care. I, I've, you know, I've got like, you know, this following on various platforms. I like just making content out there. A lot of people engage with it. They find it funny, informative, useful, helpful, shareable. I'm happy with that, you know? And even if I disappear tomorrow, they would say, oh yeah, that guy used to make some videos about like uh, health and stuff. It was quite funny. It was quite good. That's it. I'm, I've kind of done my job. I'm getting to a point now where I'm not looking at the numbers so much or the analytics. Like yeah. this week was fucking crazy and I do love to reflect on it. But like even with the podcast as well, I used to check how many downloads it had. And I was mm. like, you know what? I actually just really enjoy having a podcast. I actually really enjoy having a chat with people. Yeah. I would not have this talk with you if you went to the pub. Mm. Weird thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Knowing <laughs> that people can benefit from lift, listening to this yeah. makes me more engaged in the conversation. Probably a commercially benefited, you know, it, there's a weird thing to it. And I also love the fact that, you know, I hope now that people are listening. I hope there are some agencies. I hope there are some food delivery companies that hear our conversation <laughs> and get to see a, a better insight to someone's life and go, John, we're going to hit that guy up and we're going to say to him, hey, fucking just have some food. Or some people are going to go, hey, <laughs> they're going to go through your videos and go, right, these are what we identify as your brand values. These are mm. five businesses we think could support you. We're going to give you a roadmap to quit your job in two years. And then yeah. you'd be like, fucking, you know what? But here's another thing as well, I suppose. Are you going to carry guilt that the... Like we can objectively say that the United Kingdom health service is going to be worse off without you. Um, honestly, uh, I don't think they will. Are you uh, like, no, I'm a shit. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm a drop in the ocean. You know, I'm not a 
world leading uh, surgeon in a specific type of thing. I didn't invent anything. Uh, you know, I've done lots of research and I've published lots of papers, but I, I've not kind of uh, come across a or invented a new regime of chemotherapy. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I would say objectively, maybe it's, uh, you know, not modest, but I would say I'm a good surgeon. Um, you know, I'm a good academic. I'm a good researcher. I've done, you know, papers and things like that. But if I left, would they miss me? No, not at all. Um, and actually, but am I having a bigger impact on people's health outside the NHS? And I would say yes. So you're going to see a point now where you're actually going to be able to serve people better by leaving? Maybe. Like, for example, the, the kind of uh, thing that first springs to mind is it was Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And, you know, breast cancer, even though it's a horrible affliction, it's one of the most curable cancers that we have, um, you know, alongside bowel cancer, skin cancer, and things like that. And, but still, a lot of people don't regularly self examine because they're not taught how to. It's a relatively taboo thing talking about breasts, even though it shouldn't be. Uh, so, how do you self examine? What are you meant to look for? And I made a video saying three hidden places in your breast where cancer could be, like three areas in the breast where women don't routinely check for. They think, you know, you check your breast like that. But actually, under the armpit, because the breast actually extends toward the armpit, the axillary tail, it goes under the armpit, um, behind the nipple. Cancers can be there, retro areola cancers, uh, and actually in the space between the clavicle and the upper chest, because this is where the lymph nodes drain. So you can get cancers up here on the chest wall as well, breast cancers. So I said these three areas, and you know I had a lot of uh, messages from people saying, "Oh, thank you," and that was like you know really high, widely shared video. And then uh, I actually remember Peloton got in touch with me and said. Uh, can you do a talk for our staff about kind of breast cancer awareness and breast checking and things like that? I thought, oh, you could give me a free bike or something. No, I didn't, didn't get anything. Uh, should, but, have, should have taken the money. It'd be worth you, more in two did, years. Uh, no money either. No money. It's just, just uh, yeah. I got, I oh, think you do I, need management. <laughs> I, got, I got a couple of free like clothes or something from their shop. Uh, it didn't even fit. Um, but anyway, I, I enjoy doing that and like talking and, you know, things like that. But, um, you know, that's the thing. Like that video I did, I can't remember exactly, but I think it got a few million views uh, across Instagram and uh, YouTube and uh, TikTok. And actually I've hit, say, say it hit 2 million people. 2 million people saw that video. Okay. And then they may have shared it onto another two people. So the reach of that video may have been in the realms of 10 million people. Um, you know, and as a surgeon working in the NHS, if I do a breast clinic, I would see 20 patients in a breast clinic in one day. Fucking hell. Now this is where things start coming together. Well, actually you can actually get on your high horse and say, hold on. I'm helping preserve the lives of 10 people a week. Over here, I can stop these people from ever fucking needing surgery in the first yeah, place. Yeah, preventative rather than curative. That's that's the kind of end goal of medicine in general, preventing things. That's why we're trying to do gene therapy. We're trying to stop these things happening in the first place. And that's where lifestyle medicine comes into play. Have any of the big wigs in the NHS ever approached you and been like, we want to use you? Because... The, these big organizations, they need to communicate with younger generations. And one thing you're amazing with is you've got great hooks on social media. Mm. Four things you never know about this. Boom. Surely, surely there must be some big bosses in the NHS. If we were to look at it like an actual business, go, mate, we've got this uh, Dr. Khan. You know, we could, we could get him. We could be putting him in schools. Go, hey guys, we've got a TikToker, you know, 5 million followers. You could go in there and, you know, some prevent stuff. We could get him into colleges, you know. Maybe, you know, his salary that he's on air, we could double that and we could, you know, have a massive initiative country. Anything like that ever happened? I, uh, we, you know, I, I want to say this very diplomatically. Of course, so, you I'm know, not here to try and get you in trouble. <laughs> yeah, um, I, you know, if a, if a lot of bureaucracy in the NHS was as streamlined as how you'd put it or had some, or people had mindset as open as yours, um, it might be a lot more productive and efficient in many ways. Uh, that was very diplomatic. I was literally a cogs whirring, but <laughs> I will say, uh, yeah, I've done some adverts for the NHS kind of promoting the vaccine, which, you know, I'm not a pharmaceutical show. I actually believe in the vaccine. I've had three doses myself, so my parents. Um, I've worked with the Red Cross, British Red Cross and first aid staff, with the Royal College of Surgeons on various things. So, and, and back in the day as well, when the vaccine rollout was initially coming up, um, I took over the takeover of Boris Johnson's Snapchat 
<laughs> and I went to Downing Street, number 10 Downing Street. It was a very weird experience. Went there in a suit and everything and then we police with guns and like, who are you? And got in there, Got went into number 10 it's in, in itself. Um, Did you meet Boris? I didn't meet Morris. He was meeting the uh, president of um, Mali or something. How many that, fucking that TikTok followers he got? <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Um, but and then I went to the media suite, and then we did. I did the kind of Snapchat takeover, answering questions to reach out to a kind of younger demographic to make them sort of you know know more about COVID and the vaccines. So yeah, like you say about the uh, like bureaucratic stuff. Again, not even near your level. When I was coming up through the ranks on socials as a PT, I was you know swearing all the time and. One of the big dogs at Fitness First said, you're going to have to take the logo out of your display picture because I was wearing my PT top in my picture. I was like, oh, it's like that, is it? He was like, yeah, mate, we can't have you representing the brand. And I was like, you dumb fucks. Like, you could have used me as a poster boy. Here's James. He's been with Fitness First four months. He came in here with 2,000 followers. He's now got 150. Uh, He's now leaving the gym where I was paying $400, $200 pound a week in rent to the gym. Bloody hell. Why didn't they just say, hey, can we can we use your story to get other personal trainers in? Because all Fitness First in Australia care about is having PTs on the floor paying rent. That's how they make money on top of gym membership. I, I honestly think a lot of it is hate and jealousy. Um... And similarly, I feel I feel it a lot from bosses I work with sometimes, uh, you know, over the last couple of years, um, other colleagues. There's an air of almost dismissiveness, but that's because of some degree of jealousy, I feel, uh, without sounding too arrogant. It's almost like, you know, it's like a little bit, um, I, was, um, I was doing a night shift uh, last year and I was two minutes late to the night shift handover. The handover starts at 8 p.m. I got there at two past eight because I was struggling to find a parking spot. Uh, and then when I got in, one of the uh, doctors who was there on the night shift, and it was a really quiet day for them during the day. So there was no rush, nothing to hand over. He was like, um, oh, it's, look, you're late. Were you making TikToks or something like that? And it's just kind of like... Snidey comments. W- w- you know, and then the funny thing is this same guy the next week, he's like... Um, oh yeah, I'm thinking of starting a TikTok for like my business. How do you, you know, and it's just like, I would have been happy to help you, but you've literally been making snarky comments the entire week of night shifts when I'm knackered and tired. So fuck you. Know, you. Yeah, pretty much. There, there'll come a time. I, even in that fitness first, I know I've rambled about it on podcasts for years, but like no one was really nice to me. Mm. I was English. I was away from home. I, someone threatened to fight me if I spoke to his clients on my first day. And I was like, at the time, I, I should just let it go. But I was like, yeah. nah, fuck you. And one guy even, he's like, can you come on my podcast? I was like, mate, we worked in a gym together for a year. You, you'd you never wanted me on your podcast until I have a following. Yeah. I was like, where the fuck was the invite 12 months ago? And That's I remember it. all of this stuff. But I don't ever want to be successful just to rub it in. But no. it feels good. Yeah, especially with uh, people. I've not had many experiences like that. But I have had the occasional person, you know, from yesteryear just randomly being like hey mate and then that hey mate has like a whole baggage attached to it so I've been working with this agency and they're <laughs> super keen to meet with you and you're like oh bro you can see through it from a mile off yeah it's someone like you literally see their last message to you was 2013 happy birthday and they're like oh, yeah there, there will be that but hopefully one day and the subtle way you want to do it let's say 10 years from now you'll be at a red light in your Porsche and you look over and you'll go hey mate how did you take oh sorry Gotta go, green light. <laughs> but like, it, it, it's annoying that people are like that. And do you know what? Dieran, credit to him. When we were in a gym, like 35 personal trainers, when everyone was a bit a little cunt, Dieran would just go, how'd you do that? I was like, excuse me? He's like, how'd you do that? And then I'd sit with him. And because he was always nice to me, on my first day, he took me for a coffee. Everyone was like ripping into me. I'd get my tripod out in front of the gym and go live. Wow. 12 or 13 personal trainers would sit there having breakfast being like, look at this fucking idiot. Mm. And Dieran got up once, came around and he went, right, oh, you got 50 people watching a live. He goes, that's pretty cool. And then a couple of weeks later, he's like, so how do you communicate with people? I go, oh, well, mate, sit down. I'll tell you about email marketing. And he was like, I've been getting these for two weeks. He was, he was the only guy who would overlook any negativity and instead go, I could do this. I think it's very, unfortunately, rare in life to meet genuine people who actually like you for you 
Uh, and in your case, you know, Diran is one of those. Uh, and you know, you two have, you can see on the socials, you've got great chemistry and great relationship. And, you know, that's why I actually, I have very few friends. Um, I'm, I'm a pretty boring guy, uh, you know, opposed to what people think on socials. Um, you know, I just, I've got my dog, I'm at home, I just watch Netflix, I walk, I, I garden, uh, you know, I grow vegetables. I'm a very, very boring person. Um, you know, so, and... But I'm going to interject here. If you're content with your, what you call boring, and you're probably just being, you're just flattering, you, you're trying to, what's the word I'm trying to play here? You're very, you're very humbly just saying you've got a boring life. But if you're content with that, yeah. you have so much more than what people with exhilarating lives that feel nothing have. There are so yeah, many I'd... people out there that on paper, oh, jet ski, all this, but then they've got, you know, no sense of purpose, for yes. instance. Imagine like a trust fund kid who's got loads of money. They, they're they there going, fuck, I wish I had a purpose and I benefit society. You're there with your vegetables going, oh, saved fucking 10 lives this week. You know what? That is like a huge thing. And, and for a long time, and I'm still trying to find my own direction and my purpose. And, um, you know, I've uh, I've been very interested in the kind of science of anti-aging and longevity. Not from a Joe Rogan wellness bro angle, but more from a generally like a science kind of philosophical side of things as well and uh, there's one place there's, there's these areas in the world called the blue zones uh, where actually those cohorts of people and those populations have higher average life expectancies than other places so for example uh, Okinawa uh, in Japan island off Japan uh, it's known as the land the, or the island of immortals because it's got the highest density a highest percentage of people who are living past 100 and actually there have been lots of longitudinal studies and epidemiological studies looking at why are they living past 100 what is it they do and obviously there's lots of kind of dietary aspects a lot of vegetables and polyphenols they have in their diet a lot of exercise walking around but actually two huge things they have is they have something called a moai which is their tribe a lifelong friendship network like they will be friends with the same people for 60 years 70 years and they will be like helping them with uh stress with financial worries uh, relationships everything so that their tribe okay it's a small group of people and another thing they have is called ikigai which is their purpose in life their reason to wake up in the morning and actually i was reading that and i was like you know what I kind of have them a while, like a small group of friends, uh, definitely a stranger in the pandemic, but the icky guy, their life purpose, I don't really have that. And that's something I've been actively trying to gain. What is my life purpose? It's still not fully crystal clear, but I've definitely thinking about it in like actively, I definitely have more, more honed in on what I need to do in life. And definitely it's not working crazy shifts for the rest of my life. That is what I know so far. It's interesting you say about that because... I think purpose, people think they need to have a purpose before going into actions. When often, I think that people should go into things that fulfill their values and their purpose comes afterwards. I agree. Because when I wasn't on social media, uh, I was kind of just going through the daily motion, the daily grind. And my purpose then was I wanted to be this top surgeon. I still do. I wanted to be this like really top world leading surgeon and I wanted to do like uh, robotic surgery and I might still do. I'm not sure about that. Uh, I wanted to do all these things and it was all driven around surgery and academics and I wanted to publish, you know, papers in the highest journal and it's kind of that kind of stuff, uh, which is all valiant things for that. Then going onto social media, it opened up a whole new purpose for me and actually I much more enjoy this purpose I'm driving towards because... I'm seeing the positive effects of it, uh, you know, doors opening in various things and people's reactions to me then saying, oh my God, that's really, use really useful, really helpful. But no one would ever be like, hey mate, that paper you published on um, robotics in surgery in colorectal cancer is really interesting, changed my life. Oh, oh, look at that, it's got 24 citations on that paper. You know, th those were not things which I would get feedback on because you didn't know the latter was possible mm. yeah true so or not possible for me I, I i thought it was out of reach for me i thought i'm not destined to be this person on social media i always thought it's you know you need to be like this whatever uh, you know talented artist or whatever i never thought i could reach that level it's really interesting to that because like like you say you for me as a personal trainer the highest heights i thought i'm going to work with celebrities or athletes like Having David Beckham go, mate, I've never been able to do 20 chin-ups before. 
that could be a really cool fucking feat to have as a personal <laughs> trainer. But having someone random like on a bus or a train just come up to me and go, you really helped my sister have a better relationship with food. Thank you very much for that. I'm like, fuck, I've never even met you or your sister before, but for you to say Incredible. that, I'm like, well, I'm like, fuck, that's crazy. Or uh, there was one event I had where uh, this girl was kind of like, I was just chatting to her and there was this big guy next to me. I thought this big guy was going to deck me for chatting to his missus. So my manager kind of inches in in case something kicks off and he goes, that guy really helped my girlfriend with her mental health and how she like perceives herself. He's a fucking legend. He then came over and said, thanks. And I was like, oh, I thought I was about to get beaten up for chatting to his missus. Like, <laughs> but those things are the things that once you experience them, no, you would never, you never set out in life to experience those things. But then yeah. when you do experience them, you, you get a taste for it and you're like, the, the nobility behind doing that practice is actually very fulfilling. It's so fulfilling. And actually, as cheesy as it sounds, <clears throat> and um, I think this kind of trope is overplayed, when people say it's not about the destination, it is about the journey, uh, I always thought, what, what are you talking about? What the hell are you talking about? But I appreciate that more now. See, with social media, I'm just kind of on a journey. I, I don't know what to expect tomorrow or next week. Uh, you know, next week someone could approach me and say, hey, do you want to come on this show to talk about whatever? And that's fantastic for me. Like, you want me to come on that show to talk about health stuff? That's really cool for me. And uh, so it kind of feels like every week or every month is coming something new around the corner that I, it's unexpected. And I don't know where the journey could end. I could get cancelled tomorrow for talking about something and then that's it. But, you know, I'm just enjoying that journey and kind of living day to day on social media, which I haven't done in surgery for ages. In surgery, I'm planning years in advance. When I first started as a doctor to get into a surgical training pathway, I had to start four years before. I had to make sure I had research papers, enough surgeries, um, enough courses, enough certificates to then go into the surgical interviews and be like, hey, look at my CV. So you need to start that prep to get into surgery so much earlier. You know, almost like a, a kid trying to get into Cambridge University or Oxford. They need to start the prep, not the month before, the year before, but three or four years before when it comes to GCSEs. Same thing with surgery. So I was always planning five years in advance, uh, but now I'm not. Uh, I'm just kind of thinking, okay, what? today I'm going to talk about, you know, Johnny Depp's cut off finger, uh, you know? So it's, it's pretty crazy. There's a quote that comes to mind when you said that. They say, the man that loves walking will walk further than anyone that loves the destination. And there's such a fitting mm. point where you just get caught up in that kind of journey. And the excitement is very addictive, almost like a drug, because yeah. I had it once before where I was doing a book signing in Ireland and I'm there signing books going, this is fucking mental. And my mate comes over and taps me on the shoulder and he goes, you're f getting on the next flight because you're doing Piers Morgan in the morning, Good Morning Britain. And I was like, you're fucking kidding me. I was like, oh, I'm a bit pissed off because all my mates have come to Ireland for a night out. Then I'm on the plane like, I'm going to be on fucking Good Morning Britain yeah. with Piers Morgan tomorrow. I'm Huge. like, this is fucking mental. Then like everything just kind of comes piecing together. And you, you sound very similar to me where you feel very undeserved of your success, irrespective of doing the work, which is very normal. Uh, but also you're very excited about the unknown, which is a very fun place to be. And a lot of people are very uncomfortable from that. But a lot of people, I'm sure you've experienced in surgery and doing a lot of things, you have to cherish these periods of being uncomfortable because that's where growth occurs. Yeah. And some of my friends, if they're ever in a bit of like, they're, they're just a bit like unsettled in life. I wouldn't say they have mental health issues, but they're, they're not fully functioning and happy. Hmm. I can look to them and go, when was the last time you were truly uncomfortable? Like when was the last thing you pushed yourself where you were shitting yourself before you did it? And if they can't put their finger on it, I'm like, maybe that's your problem. You know, if there's nothing that's giving you squeaky bum all the time. Yeah, I think you need that um, almost psychological and physiological stress cues to always, you know, jumpstart you into action. Uh, you know, similar like in social media, for example, the kind of the the stress and expectation from the audience of having to put out good content. That's good because you're you're doing some research, you're thinking, you're actively kind of engaging in your brain. Um, and, and similarly, actually, I found that so one one of the big things over the pandemic, um, you know, to compensate for the stress of working as a doctor in the hospital, social media definitely was an outlet for me. But one thing which, uh, you know, definitely took a huge nosedive for me uh, over the pandemic was my own kind of um, exercise routine and sleep routines and dietary routines that I was pretty good with before. And I'm finally kind of now 
back into training hard, uh, kind of eating better, like a, a variety of foods, sleeping a lot better as well. And I feel a lot happier for those simple things. You know, a lot of people in life think, and I was of the same ilk as well, not to kind of, you know, uh, get anyone twisted. I said, I want a six pack. I want this. I want, you know, whatever inch biceps, I want all these things. And I think there is a lot of focus generally on purely aesthetics and actually uh, a lack of interest in actual health promoting behaviors. There are core health promoting behaviors, which are like having a good shit in the morning, um, you know, sleeping really well and waking up feeling fresh, not just sleeping nine hours and then waking up feeling like you've got a hangover, which sometimes does happen, but actually waking up, even if you slept five hours, but feeling fresh, having energy throughout the day, you know, having like, you know, high libido, like having a high like sex drive. That's a good thing for a human to have, you know, good testosterone levels. Um, you know, women need that testosterone levels as well. Men and women have it. Um, you know, just having energy, focus, and this kind of brain fog is not there. Um, you know, eating a wide variety of foods with lots of fiber. All of these things are health promoting behaviors, which can sometimes go missing in the pursuit of a six pack or of whatever you're trying to achieve. And that's what I was missing for a long time. I thought, you know what, I can't have this because it's X number of calories. But actually, if I'd had that, that would have been a shitload of fiber. And I've had a great poo in the morning. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting you say this. So I'm in what I'd consider a very healthy relationship. I'm mm. probably one of the healthiest relationships I've been in. And uh, because of that, I drink a lot less. She's yeah. not a massive drinker, but we spend good quality time together where it's watching a film, doing whatever. But because of that, I'm probably a couple of kilograms heavier than I would usually be. And I saw a video of myself getting out of the sea about 13 months ago and I'm leaner. Mm. And I saw it and I went, fucking hell, I look good then. But I was single. I was very unhappy with the fact that I wasn't dating. I had the pressure of being single on my shoulders that made me want to, you know, be in better shape. Yes, fast forward a year and someone could easily see me in the same pair of budgie smugglers coming out the same beach and I'm a little bit thicker but I was like fuck I'm I'm in such a, a healthier standpoint I've been much less hung over this year I've taken less recreational drugs I've had more <laughs> meaningful conversations I've had more like actual moments where I'm like really enjoyed this yeah I've been more active I played more tennis I've been surfing more all of these things and I was like I really had to take account and go what looks better and what was better yeah. And people very often overlook that. And I was like, fuck, yeah. Even though we we're ever eating, we're ever eating like nutritious for nice meals. Like when I'm with my missus and she makes like fajitas, I'm there. She buys me some beers, sit with the boys. I have two beers and I'm like so full. I'm like, oh, I'm going to bed. I'm so full. Yeah. But before it was like, you know, let's go out. Let's do this. Let's do that. And like you say, there's not always the representation of, you know, sometimes being healthier and happier doesn't look like no. what we think it might. Yeah, exactly. And that's, um, you know, one of the um, things I kind of realize is, especially when I was really at, like at uni and I was training almost every day, like five to seven times a day, I, I would actually train because, you know, gym would be so close. Number one, I was overtraining in the pursuit of wanting to get bigger muscles and get leaner, which is obviously you know, counterintuitive because you're, you know, going to spike your cortisol and actually blunt your testosterone if you overtrain and not give yourself time for recovery. But also I was training hard for an hour and a half. And then the rest of the day, I'll just be kind of like sat on the sofa, just watching TV, which kind of sounds really just silly thing to do. Like you've trained well, but then you're not optimizing the gains from that hour in the gym. Actually, it might be better if you only train maybe two or three times a week, but you're more active. You're walking the dog. You're doing all of this. So in that 24-hour period, you're more active in general compared to training hard for an hour and then doing nothing. I agree. And even last week, I was I was doing CrossFit, then doing jiu-jitsu. So I was training for two and a half hours, like most nights. Wow. I was pretty fucked. And then a couple of niggles, little issues, and I was like, oh. And it, I knew I just needed to do less. And then... Because I knew I was training for three hours, I'd be eating a lot and I'd be doing this. And I, yeah, I, exactly the same thing. And it does take that kind of balance where you say, oh, you know, I need to do less. And one, well, I remember breaking up with a girlfriend that I was dating and we had this big blow up one morning where we went for a swim. But the second we went for a swim, I was doing things on my phone because in Australia, when I wake up, I've got a finite two, three hours before UK goes to bed. And I would be more concerned with that post than I would be about our time down at the beach. Mm. So I'm going to Bondi beach with someone I'm dating and I'm more concerned my work. So now even recently I go for a swim with the missus and 
I happily miss that UK window. I'm like, fuck them, I'll get them at 3 p.m. <laughs> and she goes, do you want to have an almond croissant? And I'm like, yeah, do you know I'm not even hungry, but I do. And then we go down the beach. I've not got my phone on, giving much of a fuck about it. I'm having my croissant when I'm not hungry. I'm doing my swim and neglecting my work, but I feel better. That's incredible, yeah. And it's, it takes time. It's hard. But I'm just going to go, now. fuck this. With the implications of it, I see some emails that need to be actioned. Ah, fuck it, I'll do it tomorrow. And that relaxation on that is so crazy that a natural insight into how you feel is so much different to anything else. I sat in the same podcast studio six months ago expressing how you know frustrated I was that I couldn't go to Australia or whatever it was. But like d- correlating physique to well-being, correlation, not causation. It's one yeah. of those things that's so crazy for people to get to. And ultimately, like when I have encounters with people on the tube, they go, oh, I need to get myself in a bit of shape. Mm. I go, are you happy? They go, yeah. I'm like, well, you know, that's half the battle done. Yeah, no, it's true. I think... Um you'd often find people in the best shape of their lives are often not in the mentally best shape of their life. Uh, This is obviously not... uh, Yeah, it's not everyone. And some people straight away go, oh, I've got a six pack and I'm fucking excellent. Yeah, it might be kind of, you know, initially, wow, they've worked hard for a goal and you naturally get the dopamine rush with achieving the results, which comes with it. But then the kind of uh, health parameters you've sacrificed potentially to get there would eventually catch up with you uh, and they would eventually have a collateral effect on your mental health as well. And, you know, I would say overall, I'm pretty happy now. You know, I come back from work and I, you know, cuddle my dog, um, kind of I'm training harder, I'm training better, but not overtraining. Um, And, you know, I'm 32 now. So I'm kind of like, I feel that I'm not in my 20s anymore. So I'm not all about doing an ego deadlift in front of my friends like oh you did 150 i need to try and get a little bit more than that now and kind of you know getting a a herniated disc and things like that i'm i'm literally looking for things which i can do to optimize my my stuff now like for example um i was in the gym the other day and actually i just wanted to really you know people talk about this mind muscle connection i always thought this was like um i never delved into the science of it but i was always thinking is that just some kind of Ronnie Coleman and Schwarzenegger thing to say, like, you know, you're really whatever. But actually, I kind of, over the last few weeks, I've been giving it more of a go, like dropping the weights and just really kind of squeezing hard and, you know, doing a bit of research as well. The more actual attention you pay to the squeeze of a muscle, the more neurological fatigue you feel and the more muscle fibers you recruit. Because... The analogy I have is, say I've got a suitcase over there and I tell you the suitcase is 100 kilos. So you walk to the suitcase and and actually the suitcase is empty. You will fling it because your, your body's expecting, your brain's expecting to be 100 kilos. So you're kind of really forcing it more. So actually, if you mentally try to recruit more muscle fibers, there'll be more gains and more you know, micro tears when you're actually training and things like that. And actually, I'm tra- for the first time in my life, I'm training, kind of feeling injury free, um, you know, just feeling good and just feeling absolutely fucked at the end of training sessions. Same with picking up a can. Yeah. I have to tell my fingers to pinch enough to create enough friction to stop the can from falling through, but yeah. not so much a dent in the can. Yes. So, our ability to recruit, we start off with minimal recruitment and then we have to recruit more and more and more. Yeah. And for people listening as well, only when the reps start to really slow down and fail is where the slow twitch have been completely fatigued and the fast mm. twitch have to take over. But like, exactly like you say, so, you know, should you go too heavy or you're swinging the weight, you're not going to be able to maximize that fatigue process. No. Well, I'm the same. I, I'm, I like volume a lot more. I like doing high yeah. rep stuff. I like really going through the pain. Yeah. Whereas some people like to go heavier. But for me, even bodybuilders are supposed to use the mirror more so to see when, say I'm doing bicep curls and I see my front delt light up. I know yeah. that the, the attention has been taken away from yes. it. Yes. And I'm a big believer in even bicep curls. I now I move the bench to incline and recline positions so that uh, it's a lot harder. Remember to use much lighter weights. Mm. I don't care. When I was younger, I was like, I'm going to have to. It's ego, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But it's, it, and having that relationship with your training and martial arts for me is amazing because now if I get, say I'm two, three kilograms heavier than I was a year ago, mm. I'm much better at jujitsu now. And I get to pay in, you know, I'll, go into training and try I'll get fucked up by some people but I'll fuck up some people and that makes me feel good I'm like I'm still a weapon I can still go yeah. rounds of sparring I can still do all of this and people just need to prove to themselves and I honestly think that knowing that you're fit and able to do stuff is half of the benefits of training is actually doing it knowing that you can go full tilt on a rowing machine to finish a workout and not have a heart attack 
Mm. People need to be proving to themselves they're competent in this stuff. And I feel like not enough people are. And I think that they man they manifest a lot of things. I honestly think that knowing that you're strong, I think prevents your likeliness of getting injured. I think that if I was to spend two months out of training and then go into a game of rugby or jujitsu, that constant knowledge and worrying about getting injured, I probably put my hand in the wrong place, probably get my shoulder in the wrong position. Yeah. I, I mean, I think a lot of people just lifting heavy isn't necessarily strength. Uh, you know, strength, you know, when you have big muscles, you don't necessarily have strong ligaments and tendons and a high bone density. All those other things I mentioned, those other three things that are not muscle related, all contribute to overall strength and kind of body kind of, um, how do I say it, kind of just integrity. So you see often, you know, you see these uh, videos of these huge gorilla looking bodybuilders doing like preacher curls and then getting a, a long biceps tear, uh, you know, a little Popeye happens. biceps. And why is that happening? Because, um, you know, obviously probably the type of exercise they're doing, the weightlifting is too much and it's snapping the tendon, but also because maybe they're not paying enough heed to the, the ligaments and the kind of connective tissue, which is as important to maintain that kind of that full muscle strength. They're actually, you know, going through mobility ranges, doing things like, you know, uh, jujitsu, where actually you, the, it's a lot more kinetic movement and you're not actually just static holds and pushes. You know, you're actually functionally moving your body, which is actually supporting that, uh, you know, the cartilage and all these other things as well, which will actually strengthen your body in a way that just lifting weights won't. I saw a physio the other week and he actually blew my mind. Uh, so I've got a bit of tendonitis in the inside of my elbow. It now clicks. Hold on. Oh, yeah. Oh, squeaky so bed, any, yeah. any supination in my uh, wrist? So if, no supination? No mm -hmm. crunch? Supination? Mm. Oh, yeah. It's crunchy snow. So uh, it's from, in essence, from jiu-jitsu, from doing too much wrestling. I use my right hand a lot for stuff. and Grappling. The, yeah. And I was enjoying grappling so much that I, my weight training fell to the side. So I think it's golfer's elbow. Mm. And... Uh, this just aches. If I just lay in bed for a few hours, it aches. I got flu recently. COVID was one day for me. I had one blot nose. Flu fucked me up for eight days. And the aches were some of the most horrible. And I was doing tests all day. The aches on day one fucked me. And my elbow was the thing that hurt the most in my whole body. And it was this tendonitis that really kind of flared up. And I was like, I need to get this sorted. So this is what the physio told me. So imagine I've got a can of Red Bull and a bottle of water here. He goes, the Red Bull is the capacity of your ligaments in your joint, your elbow. The bottle of Volvic that's here on YouTube is uh, the <laughs> amount of load that you're giving to it. He goes, if I tell you to take two months out of training, I take the load away. The capacity of the ligament remains the same. Mm. He goes, then when you come back to training, the load is still higher than the capacity. He goes, so if you don't want to skip training, that's fine. He goes, we need to work on the capacity of yeah, the joint. Yeah. And he goes, so I'm going to give you some exercises, which seems counterintuitive, to work on the areas that hurt and he goes, over time, if we can build the capacity to meet the load, you won't have an injury anymore. Yeah. I was like, fuck me. There's a soundbite for TikTok. I was like, if I'd known that, that physio is, you go in, they go, oh, do this, rotate cuff, and do this. That guy telling me that in one session, I was like, mate, that's fucking brilliant. You've helped me through an analogy, understand, use an iPad, it was really good, why I've got issues and mm. what I need to do. And that motivated me to do positive change. And I was like, shit, that's, that's what... That's what so much of this is about, taking a complex topic and yeah. unmotivated people and telling them the real tangible benefits of what implementing change can do so they can reap the rewards and be pain-free. I think it's um, often there's a drive to do exercises or just things in life which look good on the surface, look good externally. And sometimes we neglect things which are hidden or internal, which actually reaps more benefits. Like, for example, um, you know, eating fiber. Uh, you know, the average adult should eat about 30 grams of fiber a day, uh, unless you've got specific inflammatory bowel disease or things something like that. 30 grams a day. Now, 30 grams a day is not a lot of fiber, actually. And if you look at lots of studies which have been done in the past, if you, a low fiber diet increases the risk of you having something called diverticular disease, right? Diverticular disease is one of the most common bowel conditions in the Western world. Uh, it's literally these little kind of hernias, little balloon things, which you get on your colon. Uh, 
because you're straining, you're constipated, you're straining, and basically the muscle layer in the bowel is a little balloon that bulges out through it. And those little sacs, those balloons can get infected, they can twist, they can pop. And that's where you get diverticulitis, inflammation of the colon. Now, why is it so common in the UK, the US and other Western countries? Because we generally have a lower fiber diet. This condition is almost absent in Africa, Asia, other places, because they have a higher fiber diet. Now, I was working with a surgeon who had come over from Pakistan. And, you know, when you see someone with diverticulitis, it's very classic. They come in with left-sided, lower abdominal pain and feeling a bit sick. That's like classic diverticulitis. Is this in older populations or? Uh, well, we see it kind of 40 plus. Uh, but actually we're seeing it younger and younger nowadays because we're eating more processed foods and less fiber. So we're seeing it younger. I've, se I've seen it in a 26 year old. Um, and I was kind of, this Pakistani surgeon was shadowing me just to get used to the system in the UK. And I said, do you want to see this patient? Uh, it sounds pretty straightforward. And then they saw the patient and was like, oh, you got left-sided pain. I've got, and they were 50 years old, left-sided pain, classic. And they were like, oh, is it tuberculosis of the bowel? I was like, what? And I realized actually, This person had done all their training in Pakistan. And so diverticulitis and diverticular disease was not even a common diagnosis. So that's why they were struggling to understand it. Um, but yeah, like something like that, eating more fiber reduces the risk of like just 10 grams of fiber a day more in your diet reduces the risk of you getting bowel cancer by 10%. And is there all case mortality as well? Like they say that hitting your fiber targets, you're going to reduce the chances of all causes of death significantly. I would say uh, significantly. So uh, some interesting things like fiber is good for your bowels uh, generally, but also it reduces cholesterol levels, which will then reduce, um, you know, cardiovascular disease. And actually there is some suggestion and this is a very early area of research. Now fiber prebiotics is something that is good for your gut microbiome. And we're still understanding what the hell the gut microbiome does. And our Understanding so far is that it does pretty much everything or it's involved in everything from your immune system to your mental health to your sleep. And fiber might encourage these good bacteria to release certain compounds which encourage sleep. So fiber is also good for sleep, potentially. That's so interesting. And you know what? I do, I do, I do poos are funny subjects, right? Yeah. I, I really enjoy and take pleasure out of having really good poos. There's, I love it. In the last, I'd say, five 10 years, yeah. I've never taken a picture of my poo, but I was in Dallas. Yeah. October 20th, maybe 21st. I shit you not, pardon the pun. <laughs> I woke up, no coffee, nothing. I went and I had a poo and I was like, wow. I was like, wow, that's one of the, the best poos that's ever been had. I was like, I've, I've got to have a look. Was it, was it, a, was it a ghost poop? Uh, Well, no, I, I definitely knew I'd done it. No, but no, no, a ghost, a ghost poop a is that leaves no trace. So that was a ghost poop. So, um, but then this is where I didn't have the opportunity to find out at this point because I didn't want tissue in the bowl to disrupt it. Yeah, of course. So I stand up, I look around <laughs> in disbelief. All right, I, uh, I, I'll show you after the podcast. It's got to be a 12 or 13 inch poo, no breakage, wrapped around the bowl. I'll tell you what. That's incredible. All right, have I'm you? Do you know the Bristol stool chart? Where are you? Where was that poo on the Bristol stool chart? I don't know what the Bristol stool chart is, but tell people while I'm literally, you're, this is going to be disgusting. It's going to be so, one of the worst things I've ever done in the Bristol podcast. Bristol stool chart is like a pictorial representation of different types of poo from Maltesers, hard constipated rabbit pellet poos to kind of your Snickers bar, you know, type four. That's a solid poo. Yeah. Um, and then it kind of goes to like one to well, seven, I think. Um, seven's like diarrhea. One's like rabbit pellets. Are you ready for this? Go for it. Okay. You're a doctor. This is this really is good. this is every day for me, to be honest. Um, that is a good poo. That is a good poo. Um, yeah, that is a highly rated poo. Uh, that's <laughs> it. So that, that, that was a type three, type four stool on the Bristol stool chart. Exactly what you should be doing. How often do you check your poo, like on a weekly basis? I take I take note of it when I'm doing it. If I was to have poor quality poo, like you know, for days on end. I'd be like, something's probably up here. And then I would literally get to the table and be like, I need veg. Yeah. I've actually, in my later years now, got cravings for vegetables, especially if I had like a boozy weekend mm. or something. I'm like, I need, I need goodness. But that's psychological or physiological. Yeah. But, and then one thing that I never done really first is getting veggies in first when I have to worry about them. That's good. Yeah. I, I think, I think um, as I've got older and the more kind of bowel cancers I've seen, more kind of other hemorrhoids and all these kind of things I've seen, 
I would encourage everyone at least two to three times a week, actually just have a look at the bowl. It sounds really crude. and but it sounds really it's crude. A, it's an indicator of health. Massively. And uh, I think it was Stanford University, or they were associated with another lab, they've uh, come up with a prototype um, toilet where it analyzes your uh, butthole and your poo. Now, <laughs> your butthole or the anoderm specifically, the junction between the anal canal and the skin around your anus, that has a specific wrinkle pattern, which is unique for you. Like a fingerprint. Like a fingerprint. Did I see this on one of your TikToks? Possibly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a while back, maybe. So, you know, analyzing that specific uh, thing, so that can identify that's your bum. Okay. So that's a good, like a marker, like the kind of iPhone version of opening up the toilet. So no one else can poo in it as well, maybe. Um, and then, yeah, your stool does a stool analysis. And stool analysis is incredible because we do stool analysis for infections, uh, for blood, you know, which can indicate underlying cancer in some cases. It can at least raise their suspicion of that. And also your microbiome, you know, fecal microbiome. Uh, we look at the poo and that and that is a determinant of your health. And it can tell us about your metabolic health, your cancer risk, autoimmune r disease risk, any infections that are going on, your just state right now in your body. Um, so it's incredible. And I think you should look at your poo for a gross screening. Is there any blood? Is it loose? Is it, um, you know, kind of, does it look kind of mushy? Is it floating? Because if it's floating, is there, are you having a problem digesting fats? And there's a lot of fat in your stool, which is making it float. It could be an indication of celiac disease, which is quite common in the Western world. It could be an indication of pancreatic insufficiency. You know, your pancreas is not producing enough lipase enzyme to digest fats. Um, you know, have you got gallbladder issues and you're having fatty stool? Uh, all of these things is really important. You know, just from that, you can tell so much about someone's health. Would it be a good idea then for people to potentially, you know, like you have doctor checkups. Mm. Like you say, imagine if you just, uh, once every six months, were inclined to go to the toilet on a Monday morning, before you even get the morning off work to do it, you go in, you go to a certain laboratory, you do a poo, cool, we're going to take that, send it off to a lab, cool, like as a check-in. I, I think we're probably getting there. The more we understand about microbiomes, that would be a, a valid tool, um, you know, because I think it's still too early to have prescriptive medicines for individuals, bespoke medicines to treat based on microbiome, but we are getting there. And testing stool would be a way to, you know, determine that because we do poo transplants for ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease. And it's been shown to actually have positive effects. You take someone's healthy poo, or the, not poo, but like their gut bacteria, and then you put it into someone else, like a poo pill into someone else, and they improve. That's incredible. And I think that that's a lot less invasive than getting your bloods done. Because whenever you get a blood test, you're like, oh my God, what's, what's wrong yeah. with me? It's very, uh, you know, stressful for people to do that. But doing something like that, that's, that's absolutely mental. There's a, <laughs> we've done a chapter of this podcast about poo. Have you? But you know what I'm yeah. saying? We just have now. Yeah. So like, I didn't expect that when you walked in. But, you know, I think when you were saying that you feel like horrible when you don't have a good poo. And, um, you know, that's because I feel the same way as well. Uh, if I'm doing a, like a horrible shift and I kind of miss the window, um, you know, it's always like, you know, the circadian clock is all based around certain cues throughout the day. You know, if you don't eat at that kind of specific time, it, it's fine kind of, but there are major things like if you don't sleep at that certain time that your body's used to, if you don't poo at that certain time your body's used to, those are major kind of pillars in the day which are disrupted. And the domino effect of that would mean that the lack of poo has some effect on certain hormones which are released which then has a knock-on effect on other hormones. And all these knock-on effects and this butterfly effect is, at the end of the day, it could affect your mood, your sleep, your breath, your attitude, everything, your hunger levels. There's even, um, I think Julia Enders did a book called The Gut, which, uh, have you read that? No. It was like really good. It had like pictures in and it was talking about the amazing, you might have, mentioned before the amazing thing that stops you from shitting yourself that allows you to fart without shitting yourself yeah it's like 36 muscles that work perfectly in conjunction to allow that beautiful process to let gas out the ass without shit yeah it's and then i read the book and i was like that's amazing but in one of it she goes the the by the mind wants to be comfortable to poo and she goes you'll find that when you travel long haul flights you don't poo as much as you used to because your body yeah. quite literally doesn't want to poo in that environment and I was like, wow, there's a lot more here going on than I thought. Yeah, I, you know what? A lot of people have asked me about this, um, this kind of like vacation constipation or travel uh, vacation constipation. Vacation, yeah. So, you know, why why do people get constipated when they grow abroad? And um, 
Could it be a partnership thing as well, not wanting to poo in the same toilet as a partner? Um, I think it's one of the things is maybe you're not in your own throne. Uh, you know, you don't have your own throne, so it's a new environment, as you alluded to. I think another thing is like potentially you're crossing different time zones. So that kind of um, disruption to your circadian clock has a disruption to your poo cycle because it's part of that flow. And probably the other thing, which is I think me personally, uh, the most important thing is just me coming from my house to here, I'm now exposed to a different environment of microbiome, different bacteria in the environment, interacting with you everywhere, okay? And now imagine you go out of the UK and you're going to Peru, right? It's even longer away in different environments. So, you know, even in this water, there's different gut bacteria than the water I'm drinking back at home. And that can have some interplay potentially and cause constipation. That's what I think. I think it's driven by the bacteria and mic microbes that you're exposed to, potentially. This is all interesting stuff. And I'm sure it's going to make a very good TikTok. <laughs> um, so from people listening to this, they should have an understanding of like where, you know, where you've come from, what you're doing now. The future for yourself sounds really exciting. Have you got any like projects or things on the horizon that you would like to showcase or talk about? Or um, Well, I'm definitely thinking about podcasting uh, in the next few months um, and a couple of other things which I'll tell you off podcast but I want to keep it under wraps for now okay well uh, if people want to find you your biggest platforms are TikTok Instagram Twitter uh, I'm on Twitter uh, I'm trying to be more active on it now but YouTube YouTube and how's YouTube again uh, it's a grind it's uh, hard work it's hard, very hard work and I think um, I'm conditioned to expect fast views and a lot of views because of TikTok and short format but YouTube is a hard grind. It's a hard grind. The gratification uh, necessary for it, like you say, it's a slow grind, but hopefully the fruits will, uh, the fruition will be worth it come the end. You've been a fantastic guest. We've had an excellent chat. Thank you very much, you very much for coming in today as well for this. Uh, guys, if you're not following, make sure you're following, stay a part of the journey. And what I think and I expect will happen when you do maybe move into the, the idea of monetizing, people will be happy to see you doing that especially people that now know your story after this podcast, they'll be able to be like, yeah, go get that money. Even if you're talking about probiotics, I'll be like, go get that money. Get that paper. And go have a lay-in and fucking keep your car at home so you don't have to pay for parking and get your dog something nice. But yeah, cheers. Thank you very much for coming in. Thanks, James. Cheers.